Thank you, Brian. And um, before we get started tonight, I'd just like to um, make it clear that what I'm saying tonight is not the views of the Residential Advisory Service RAS or Community Law Canterbury. They are my own personal views. Having said that, I stand by everything that I say tonight. So let's get going. Substandard earthquake repairs, what you need to know. When I put this together, I was thinking, if I was a homeowner, what information would be the most useful? So there are little bits of everything in here, and I'm just hoping that everyone who hears this presentation will be able to find one thing at least that they can take away with them and leave tonight just being a bit better informed. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of coverage in the media about the substandard repairs lately. It started from a thing which was coordinated by MB, which is the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment, and called the Canterbury Earthquake Damage and Repair Project, referred to as CEDAR. And what happened, um, through the Residential Advisory Service and Community Law, MB approached us and asked us to provide them with 14 examples of substandard repairs. So we did that, and they went and investigated them as part of Stream 1. And um, these were all repair jobs which had been signed off as being complete, so they weren't ongoing. And um, 13 of the 14 were found to contain substandard building work that was obviously cause for concern. Um, and so some of those cases came back through the Residential Advisory Service as we assisted homeowners to engage with EQC and have the defective work remedied. But MB wanted to find out just how widespread the problem was, so they commenced Stream 2. And with Stream 2, they randomly sampled 101 properties. Um, and these came from the Canterbury Home Repair Program, so they came from Fletcher's. They also came from Southern Response and IAG. All re house repairs in the project were exempt, so none required building consent. None had had inspections from the council, and none had had a code compliance certificate. And the reason for that is that MB identified these repairs as being high risk. Eleven repairs were excluded from the survey because they contained no structural repairs. Thirty-five repairs, or 39 per cent, complied with the building code. Twenty-three repairs contained minor defects or were borderline. And 32 repairs, or 35 per cent, more than a third, clearly breached the building code. So that was a huge cause for concern. As a result of that, EQC announced that it was going to audit around 3,600 of its repairs. And I understand that IAG is also carrying out audits of its repair program. Um, so what do you do about it? What a homeowner needs to do is broadly identify the issues that need to be addressed. So when there's a substandard repair, it could be that the damage wasn't assessed properly in the first place. It might be that the building work wasn't properly supervised by the project manager, there wasn't sufficient quality assurance, or it could be poor workmanship on the part of the builder. So in one of these cases under CEDAR, one of the builders had used a jandal to prop up a, a pile. Um, clearly that was substandard building work and a workmanship issue. Um, homeowners should also try to obtain all relevant information. So get as much information as you can from EQC or your private insurer, um, and including where relevant the building contract, any experts' reports, all the kind of stuff that will enable you to make informed decisions about what to do about your substandard repairs. Also clarify all matters relating to the process for remediation. So it's things like, who's your contact person going to be? How often will you communicate with them? Um, what will be the form of communication? Who will be copied into communications? If there's a problem, who do you go to? All those sorts of things. Um, obtain expert assistance as required. Only seek expert assistance when necessary. So if, there, if it's clear that repairs are substandard, 
it shouldn't be the homeowner who's paying for experts, but either EQC or your insurer should offer to pay for independent investigation of the building work. And finally, negotiate an acceptable outcome. So the key to it is engaging constructively with either EQC or your private insurer. Um, and there are various ways that that can be done, so we'll talk more to that further on down the presentation. So going into identifying the issue, as I spoke earlier, one of the problems could be that the earthquake damage wasn't assessed properly. Um, so when you're going around a property, you want to make sure that all of the earthquake damage has been captured and that when a scope of works is finalised, both EQC insurer and the homeowner should agree on the scope of works. Um, if it's a TC3 site or maybe even a TC2, you want to know if the site condition has been assessed. So what's the loading capacity of the land? Has there been geotechnical drilling, either shallow or deep drilling on site? Um, then once the repair strategy is identified, especially for foundations or structural elements, does that strategy meet the MB guidelines? Does it meet the building code? Does it meet the policy standard or the standard in the Earthquake Commission Act? Has the damage been assessed properly and is the right repair identified? Moving on to workmanship issues. Um, so questions that you might want to ask yourself at this stage is, has the building work been carried out with reasonable care and skill? So if another builder came and looked at the building work, would they say, well, this is a good job, or this is all right? Or would they say, this is the worst job I've ever seen? <coughs> um, has the building work been completed within a reasonable time? So you might be told, this is going to take 16 weeks to do this repair, but it takes 28 weeks. That doesn't sound like it's reasonable. Moving on to quality assurance issues. So you'd want to satisfy yourself that what was in the scope of works, or the DRA, is what has been done on site. It should match up. Um, has the building work been inspected at relevant intervals? So for consent and repairs, building inspectors look at the building work after each particular milestone. For example, when the foundation has gone down and the concrete's been poured, um, when the framing's gone up, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the work's been signed off, was it signed off by a suitably qualified professional as meeting the building code? So for structural elements, that would be signed off by a chartered engineer. Um, for cosmetic work, it would be signed off by a licensed building practitioner. Okay, so moving on to obtaining the relevant information, because the key to this as homeowners is that a house may be your most valuable asset and it's really important to make good business decisions about how to pursue and to progress your claims. And in order to do that, your decisions need to be informed decisions. So with EQC, you can request your full file and also from Fletcher's under the Official Information Act 1982. Um, and if there's a particular decision that you want to challenge, then you can, under Section 23 of the Official Information Act, you can ask for the reasons for that decision and the information relied on. A good example of that is apportionment of claims. EQC might say 35% for September, 30% for February, and 35% for June. Why? Um, homeowners might say, but all the damage happened in February or it all happened in September. And so sometimes it's hard to understand apportionment decisions, so you're entitled to the reasons for those decisions. Um, similarly, with private insurers, you can request your file under the Privacy Act 1993. And private insurers owe you a duty of the utmost good faith, which means they need to keep you informed. In addition, the Fair Insurance Code requires them to provide you with relevant information and to let you know how your claim is progressing and to 
settle your claim um, quickly and efficiently. And so I've just got a quote here, and this quote is from a report which was done by the Privacy Commissioner and the Chief Ombudsman in relation to official information net requests with the EQC that were taking months longer than they should have taken. So they're pretty high-powered authors, and they said, timely, full, clear, and accurate information is especially critical in the context of disaster recovery. Disasters bring such uncertainty and vulnerability to affected populations. And for me, two things resonate from that quote, and the first is that when we're talking about getting information, we need timely, full, clear, and accurate information so having part of the picture isn't enough to make an informed decision, but you need full information. The second thing is just two words that they used, uncertainty and vulnerability. And I've seen many hundreds of homeowners since I've been doing this work. And those are two words which really ring true for the position that homeowners feel that they are in. So one of the challenges in this space is dealing appropriately with the uncertainty and the vulnerability. Clarifying the process. So um, essentially the process, whether you're dealing with EQC or your private insurer, should be fair. It needs to be a fair process. So I've said the principles of natural justice must be observed by EQC, Fletchers and the contractors. and Private insurers also need to keep you informed and to settle all claims quickly and fairly under the Fair Insurance Code. And the Fair Insurance Code is a code that all insurers have signed up to. They have all agreed that they will abide by this code and they can all be held to it. And it's freely available online. Um, so just talking about natural justice a bit more, what's the legal authority for it? It's in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990. This is an extremely important piece of legislation as part of this country's constitution, and it has more weight than just an ordinary enactment such as the Earthquake Commission Act. And what it says under section 27, every person has a right to the observance of the principles of natural justice by any tribunal or public authority, which includes EQC, and that has the power to make decisions in respect of that person's rights, obligations, or interests protected or recognised by law. So that includes your earthquake claims. No question. Section 3, it applies to all three branches of government, including the executive branch, and the executive branch includes EQC. It also extends to Fletchers and the contractors that they use. And under Section 6, all legislation must be interpreted consistently with the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, including Section 27. So the Earthquake Commission Act needs to be interpreted so as that EQC has to carry out its obligations to you in a fair manner. They need to treat you fairly. So um, just drilling down into the principles of natural justice, because it sounds fine to have these high lofty principles, but what does this mean in practice? It means disclosure of all relevant information to all affected persons. So the information which is relevant and that you need, you're entitled to it. And that would even extend to having a copy of the contract between EQC and the builder or your insurer and the builder um, if there is such a contract. Secondly, all affected persons must have an opportunity to be heard. So once you have the information, you should have time to consider it and to respond to it um, to EQC or your insurer before they finalise their decision. Um, all decisions must be reasonable, so there must be a rational basis for making the decision. And that means that all decisions must be made within a reasonable time frame. And everyone knows that it's past five years now, so that's highly relevant. And finally, it reiterates that reasons must be given for any decision. So providing reasons means that it's not possible to make arbitrary or unfair decisions. 
So it's really vital that reasons are provided because then if the reasons are weak, you know how to challenge that. If they're strong, then maybe the decision is fair enough. Um, but without reasons, it's impossible to make that assessment. Moving on to expert assist assistance. It's worth thinking about what experts do you need. So if it's um, a structural issue, then you might need a structural engineer. If it's something to do with your site, the way your site's performing, the land is soft, or that kind of thing, then you might need a geotechnical engineer. If it's not a structural element, then a builder might be fine. So it's identifying which expert you need. Um, then there's a the question, who will have to pay for the experts? Um, I was just reading an email from EQC that said that no EQC customer will have to pay anything for their remediation to take place. Well, remediation includes the cost of, for example, an independent builder or an independent engineer. Um, are any free services available? So you might be able to receive the support you need from the Earthquake Support Coordination Service. Um, it might be worthwhile getting in touch with CANCERN. Perhaps the Residential Advisory Service can help either with legal assistance or a technical review of engineers' reports. Um, when are the experts required? So we often find that there are times with our claims where they sit quite dormant and there's not much activity. And then there are times when they're really busy and things seem to be happening all at once. And generally that's a time when it's good to have experts on hand. Having said that, sometimes it's good to go to experts earlier because often they have big workflows and there might be an eight to 12 week delay before they can come out on site and do a report. Um, and what do you need the experts to do? So it's really thinking about what is the issue here? And because in a sense, you're trying to build a case. So what do you need your expert to establish that will make a difference to the decision maker? Which feeds into the next point. Will what your expert says make a difference? Because if it's not going to make a difference, um, then there's no point in engaging the expert in the first place. So that's worth taking that into account as well. Um, so moving on to what rights do homeowners have? Because you, you're stuck with a subsidy repair and you just think, well, what can I do about it? Where can you go? Um, and it's important to know the legal basis that supports your position. So one important statute is the Consumer Guarantees Act. So that's part of New Zealand's consumer protection legislation. And I'm just going to talk to two sections about this. So section 28, where services are supplied, this includes building services. There is a guarantee that the service will be carried out with reasonable care and skill. That addresses workmanship issues. Secondly, um, where services are supplied, there is a guarantee that the service will be completed within a reasonable time. Um, and so that's a guarantee that cannot be contracted out of and is highly relevant in Christchurch in 2015. Um, in the Building Act, though, which is the primary piece of legislation for building work, there are a number of implied warranties. They're buried quite deeply in the Building Act, section 362I, so it's not exactly front page news, <laughs> but they are in there, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to highlight some of them. But before I do that, um, it's important to understand that warranties are implied into every building contract. So um, even if they're not written on the contract, they're still part of the contract. In addition, you might not be a party to the contract, but you can still enforce the warranties. They still are there for your benefit. And the other parties to the contract cannot contract out of the warranties. They are still bound by them, even if they would rather not be. So what are the warranties? Let's have a look at them. So they all start with building work will be carried out. 
so in a proper and competent manner. So it has to be to a, a sufficient standard in accordance with the plans and specifications set out in the contract. So that's why it's important to get a copy of the contract so you can assess whether or not that's happened in accordance with the relevant building consent. If your repairs have gone to consent, you have an extra layer of protection that you do not have with exempt work. Um, and so the building work has to comply with the plans and specifications in the building consent as well as the ones in the contract. In addition, all building work must comply with all laws and regulations. That includes the building code. No exceptions, the building work must comply with the building code. Building work must be carried out with reasonable care and skill. It has to meet the standard of a reasonable builder. And again, must be completed within a reasonable time. There is no excuse for unreasonable delay. Moving on, what's the best way of resolving your particular issue? Um, so there can be a lot of different ways of engaging with agencies, EQC, Fletchers, private insurers, um, project management organisations. Um, so it might be appropriate to do that by way of written communications, emails, letters, that kind of thing. Um, but often it's quicker and more efficient if you can have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, then it's a more dynamic setting, there can be a freer exchange of views, and it's possible to sometimes make more progress. If the issue is a technical issue to do with what's happened on site, site visits can be beneficial because um, the problem that needs to be addressed is right before people's eyes and they have to face it. Um, hot tubbing of experts, so sometimes you might have an, insure, an engineer for the insurer, engineer for the homeowner, on paper they disagree, get them together and they realise that if they explain their position properly to each other, they do agree and they can come up with a solution that meets the needs of both parties. Um, and also, what's the information sharing process? So is it going to be by email? Are there going to be regular follow-up meetings? Um, that kind of thing. And if parties are in dispute, what's the process? Is it going to be just by having an informal meeting? Is it going to be through mediation? For example, EQC has an internal mediation service where, which enables homeowners to resolve disputes with EQC. Is it going to be through arbitration or will parties need to go to court? Often in building contracts, there's a dispute resolution clause, so it tells the parties which steps they have to follow in order to resolve a dispute. <clears throat> Finally, if a dispute is resolved and there is a settlement agreement, it's really important that the settlement agreement is full and records what was actually agreed. Um, so who will be responsible for the remedial work? When does it need to be done by? What is the standard? Who will check it? When is it signed off? What will be the defect liability period? Um, if it's breached, what happens? All those things are really important elements of a good settlement agreement. So moving on to implications for homeowners. <clears throat> First of all, um, compliance with the building code has been the standard for whether or not future house insurance is likely to be offered. So what insurers are asking for, and we've heard this at other seminars, is a code compliance certificate if a consent was applied for, or a certificate of acceptance if the work was exempt. So both of those documents come from a council and certify that work um, complies with the building code. Um, secondly, if repairs are substandard, equity or the value in houses is likely to be compromised. So if an owner goes to sell their house, they might find it harder to sell their house or they might get less money for the sale. Um, and on this line, mortgages, banks and financially interested parties are asking what was the earthquake damage, how was it fixed, what standard was it fixed to. 
Um, and prospective purchasers, when they carry out their due diligence on properties, may also ask what was the extent of earthquake damage and what were the repairs. Um, and if the repairs are not um, to a sufficient standard, then they either may decide not to put in an offer or they'll, put in, they'll reduce the amount of their offer and the homeowner will lose out. So moving on to the key messages from this presentation. Um, first of all, all earthquake repairs must comply with the building code and the standard of repair in either the Earthquake Commission Act for EQC claims or the insurance policy, so that's the as new standard. Secondly, repairs may be defective due to flawed assessment practices, insufficient quality assurance processes or poor workmanship, but whichever one it is needs to be identified so you know which issue needs to be tackled. Thirdly, and this is really important, homeowners must be treated fairly and reasonably by both EQC and private insurers, so the process matters. There should be good communication, the relationship should be healthy, and the process should work for both parties. Four, homeowners are entitled to have their defective repairs remediated to an acceptable standard, and the minimum standard is the standard in the building code. And five, um, further investigation should be carried out in relation to consented repairs, cosmetic repairs, and claims that have been cash settled. So I say that because the audits are just focusing on the exempt structural repairs, and I'm suggesting that they sh should be extended out to cover a wider scope of repairs. <laughs>